Amen. Thank you so much, Ashley, uh, for leading us in worship here this morning. A beautiful heart that loves the Lord and able to experience that together here today. So thank you again for that. Today, as our choir is making their way to their seat, I just want to remind you of just a few things to keep in prayer, even as we speak today out of the book of 1 Thessalonians. There's a lot of great things that God is doing and has been doing over the past few weeks and months um, here at West Acres and preparing us, getting us ready for, I believe, a supernatural movement from God and what he's preparing his church, our hearts and our lives for. And I want to make sure just to encourage you that you're still remaining in the Return to Holiness book uh, as we went through our Hagios conference. And this book should be a book that you hold by your side. It should be underneath your Bible uh, where you do your devotion time. And when you pick your Bible up first, then you're able to see this secondly. Uh, to be able to be reminded of where we are, where God wants us to be, and how to get from where we are to where he desires. So I encourage you to make sure that you're still taking time to be in the return to holiness. Another book that I want to share with you, if you've not purchased, we can get for you, or you can purchase off Amazon.com or wherever it may be, uh, but it's a book entitled How to Develop a Powerful Prayer Life. How to Develop a Powerful Prayer Life. It goes right along beside returning to holiness. So please, if you will, let's continue. The Lord didn't take us through a Hagios conference and challenging us and through messages and all that we're hearing to kind of let it slide and go. So let's keep it at the forefront. And one of the ways we're going to help you to keep it before uh, the forefront of your life is through our home groups that will be beginning on September the 20th, really, in the homes when we'll begin our study. We'll have a kickoff on September the 13th next week. Byron Paulus will be here preaching, the writer of our home group study book that we're going to be looking at, entitled One Cry, One Cry. I've had an opportunity to read most of the book and going through in preparation and planning for messages that I'll be preaching that will be going along with this, and it will continue to lead us. It's all about seeking God for a spiritual awakening. A spiritual awakening that God we know wants to bring, but he can't bring because vessels are so full of so many other things, they can't be filled with the presence of God to bring a mighty movement in the church and outside these four walls. So that's what we're going to be looking at uh, in our home group study. And I really, I, I can't tell you enough how I wish we had 95% of our church involved in home groups. I wish that we had 100%. Uh, but if we had 95, 80% of our people involved in home groups going through this study together as a church, as a body, uh, we'll be able to see great, great things happen. And uh, I just felt like it was important enough even to stand and share that with you at the beginning because that's what our message is about today. We're continuing the thought of really asking the question, what really pleases God? And we're going to be talking about a life today, living your life to please God out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And as we deal with this scripture here today, it's a familiar passage of scripture to most all of us in this room. But has so many truths that God has for us so that we can know how to live. You ever ask the question, God, what do you want me to do today? How do you want me to live today? How am I to, to, to carry out the day that's before me? He tells us, even in this passage of Scripture, eight verses of Scripture, and he tells us how we're to live, and if we live this way, that we'll be pleasing to God, to be pleasing to him. And to me, if I can get that answer, know what it is, and then have I know his strength to help me to live it out, I'm good to go. And I know that we all will be if we just see and hear the Word of God. Today, if you will, take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to stand in honor of reading God's Word as we do every time we um, come before the Lord, but Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 1, and I'm going to read through verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It begins like this. Finally then, brethren, 
We urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage and defraud his brother in this manner, because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. I want you to listen to that one last verse again. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Father, thank you today that we can come and bow before you in prayer. And we can, Lord, know that you have a word for us today. And Lord, we also know that if we're not connected and not attentive and not purposed in our heart to hear from you, that more than likely we're not. So Father, I pray even now that you will help us to be sincere in our prayer that we pray. And I pray that Lord, folks are not just listening to the prayer I pray, but I pray they're praying mainly, Lord, to help us to be attentive, help us to be focused, help us to be purposed, help us to know why we're here, help us to know, Father, that your word wants to penetrate, touch our heart and our lives, and lead us to be a people who can truly be pleasing to you. Give me your words to say, Father. Lord, there's no other day that's more important than this day. Today's the day, the time, the hour, the moment that you have given us to gather corporately in your house to hear a word from you. And Lord, uh, the scripture you have for us today, it's not by coincidence or chance that we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But we believe, Lord, that is your word for us today. That's what you want to speak into our hearts and our lives this morning. And I pray, Lord, the devil will have no authority, will not have the ability to get in this room in our hearts and our lives and distract, destroy, cause us to miscommunicate the things that you have for us here today. I pray, Father, that we will be so in tune and so in touch with you today that we will certainly leave here today knowing without a doubt we have heard from you. Lord, we cry out to you right now asking, we want to be holy as you're holy. We want to be sanctified. We want to be set apart. We want to be people that do not compromise, but Lord, have our eyes set on the goal, the prize, that prize, that goal, pleasing and honoring to you and finishing well in this life that you've called us in the world that's becoming darker every single day, but you still desire us to finish well. And I pray that we'll make a step toward finishing well here this morning. Lord, please would you encourage people in this room today to pray for me today. Uh, that I say what you want me to say. That it not be anything that I desire to say, but from you will come forth from my mouth. Hide me behind your cross. May I decrease today so you can increase. And again... We want to leave here today saying, oh, what a Savior. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do. We love and praise the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated this morning. And if you will, if you'll just hang out at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 through 8, we're going to be taking each of the verses and looking at them and seeing how they uh, speak to our hearts personally here today. You may say, well, I've, I've studied this passage or I've heard sermon after sermon on this over the year time of life, but I believe that God speaks to us right where we are when we need it and for such a time as this, that he speaks to us and it may be differently than he spoke to us the last time because he meets us right where we are with the circumstances that we find ourselves facing every day. So uh, today, as we see this scripture, as you know, the book of 1 Thessalonians deals 
uh, deals with the second coming of Jesus Christ, and I love talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. I think we love to hear about it because we know it's going to happen. There's much, much, much more in the Bible about the second coming of Jesus Christ than there was about the first coming of Jesus Christ. And we know for sure, definitely for sure, that Jesus came the first time with less being said than there's being said the second time. So that should encourage us and reinforce in our hearts and our lives that he certainly, definitely is coming again. And we, we need to be ready and we need to be prepared for that time when Jesus enters this place, comes to take his children home to be with, with him. Uh, the doctrine of the rapture, we'll kind of deal with a little bit here today and see what we believe the scripture to teach there. We're going to be talking about how the church, how it will be caught up out of this world and will meet the Lord in the air according to scripture. Paul says though, he says no one knows, no one knows the exact time. And all of us would testify to say we know that, we've heard that, we believe it, that no one knows the exact time that he's going to come. When we least expect it, though, I believe the Bible teaches us, when we least expect it, Jesus is going to come for you, and he's going to come for me, and he's going to come for all the believers. So that is an encouraging thing for us to think about here this morning, even in the world we live in, that when we least expect it, uh, Jesus is going to come back for all believers and take us home to be with him. Uh, the Bible clearly states that, and it's something that he's given to us to look forward to. Uh, something that we can anxiously wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but there's something very important about it in 1 Thessalonians 4. Even with Jesus getting ready to come back as the scripture says he's going to, he says it's very important how we're living life here. It's very important what we're doing here, how we're, how we're living this life called the Christian life in the world today. Now, understand me here this morning, before Jesus comes back for his church, we have to ask the question again, and I want you to ask yourself personally today, how am I to live? Before he comes back, or maybe look at it a little differently here today, maybe you look at it in your life, knowing that Jesus is going to come back, believing in your heart that he's going to come back, are you living in a way that's pleasing to him before he comes back? Is he, is he good to go with your lifestyle and the way you're living right now? You knowing, his scripture says he's going to come back. Are you living the life that he desires you to live? In light of the fact that Jesus may come back at the end of this service. In light of the fact that Jesus may come back in the middle of this service. In light of the fact that Jesus may come next week, next month, or next year, how are we to live our lives? How are we to live in a way that will be pleasing to the Lord? That has to be a question that many of us, if not all of us, are asking or have asked in our lives. We're wondering how we're to live this life. We know how to live. We live. We go through the motions. We do things. We're in church today. We'll do things tomorrow. This week we'll have things that may be different than last week. But, but we want to find ourselves being faithful as much as we possibly can in our walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. We want that to happen. But are we? really living in a way that's showing the Lord Jesus that we're prepared for your return to come and take your children home, come to take your church home. In the last verse of chapter 3, in the last verse of chapter 3, the Bible speaks of the coming of Jesus Christ with all his saints. It talks about him coming with all his saints. If Jesus Christ is coming, as the Bible so clearly describes, how am I to live my life in light of those facts? Am I to, am I to take it for granted or am I to be like the people of Noah's day? How as a Christian, how as a Christian am I to live my life? That is the question we have before us here this morning. That is what we hope to settle and have clear before we leave this place today. I believe, according to the word of God, I believe we're to live this life without any, and I want you to understand this, without any ounce, not an ounce of compromise. In light of the fact that Jesus is coming back, there can be no compromise within our lives. 
No compromise with the word of God. No compromise by the how, we, how we live our life. No compromise in how we make decisions and choose what's right and wrong. That there's no compromise in our lives. Think about the times we compromise and how compromising gets us in trouble. How compromising moves us away from the relationship that God desires you and I, us to have. In fact, listen carefully this morning. I believe the Bible teaches here in the fourth chapter of the book of 1 Thessalonians that Christianity is a life and it's not a religion. It's the way we live life. Christianity, that's what it is. I never want to put Christianity and religion together because they're total opposite of one another. Christianity should be always together with life. How we live our lives should be an example of a Christian. Christian, I'm a follower of Christ. How am I living my life? Following Christ. How am I making decisions? Looking to Christ. See, 1 Thessalonians 4.1 says this. It says, finally, then brethren... We urge and exhort the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how, listen, you ought to walk and to please God. How you ought to walk and how you ought to please God. The verse says it is a walk. It says that it's a wall. Christianity is not an ornament that we wear around our neck. It's not a bumper sticker that we put on the back of our cars. It's not a t-shirt that we wear. It's not a routine that we endure. That's not what Christianity is about. And that's what we're learning about through all of the studies of holiness and walking worthy of the call of God within our lives. Christianity is a life that you live not once a week, not once a month, but every single day of your life. That's Christianity. That's why God has me here this morning. To, to remind me of that and to tell you that. To tell you that Christianity is every single day of your life. When you feel good, it's part of your life. Whenever you're down and discouraged, it's part of your life. It is your, it's your, how you walk. It's how you live. It's who you are in this world. The Bible says, again, it's a walk. A walk, what does a walk do? A walk represents movement. A walk represents progress. You can't walk and not make progress. Whenever you walk, you, you make progress. You're going toward a desired destination. And, and that destination, if it's Christ, you're following him. You're trusting him. When you're weak and weary and not sure where to go or what to do, you follow Christ. And you say, how do I do that? Through his word and on your knees and having that relationship with him that, that changes us from the inside out. So today, church, our question is how am I going to walk this walk? How am I going to walk this walk? Would you please today, and I believe you are, but would you please remain so attentive, maybe as attentive as you've ever been attentive, as you've heard me stand or anyone stand and share the word of God, because today for us, this is a word. The first thing that I want you to see, the first thing the Bible teaches us that we, that we ought to walk, he says that we ought to walk in purity. We ought to walk in purity, and it's so clearly stated in the word of God. You, you don't hear much about that here in the church today. You've been hearing a good bit about it as we've talked about holiness and as we've talked about our prayer walk and relationship with the Lord and walking in purity, having clean hands and pure hearts so that we can be pleasing to the Lord, but we don't hear about that much. Many would even say that it's out of date, that it's not for this day and time, but the people of Thessalonica knew nothing. They knew nothing of living lives in purity. They knew nothing at all. And church, I want you to have a little bit of background here in this region that we're talking about here. God called out by his spirit some people and they repented of their sins. God saved them and then here's what he did. They repented, God called, they repented, they were saved and God called them and placed them back into this region and this country to go and teach and preach and proclaim what purity was about, what a relationship with God was all about. 
These people probably had more temptations. Listen, more temptations to distract them from living a life of purity than we do here in America today. Now, that seems like that would, that's not true. That's not the case. America has moved so far. But I know you may find it hard to believe that that's the case. But no matter how pagan America is, no matter how pagan America is, it's nothing to compare with the paganism of the first century Rome in the Greece culture. We're not even anywhere close to that. We're not even close to that. Understand, before we go any further, there's no way this morning that I can impose purity and holiness on your life. If I could, I would have a long time ago. I can't impose it. I can't make you leave here more pure, more holy. I wish I could, but I can't do that. I can't do that at all here today. God's not going to make you walk in purity and holiness He's not going to force it on you. It's a choice that you must make. Look again at verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus, exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God. It says to exhort, which means what? It means to request, or I like the other meaning, which is, goes along beside that request meaning, but it's a little more forceful and powerful. It means to beg. It means that I beg you. To beg, exhort, means I urge you. I beg you. This is something that has to become a reality in your life. So when the Bible says you're to be pure and holy, when it says you're to be sanctified, it means that you're to be set apart. In other words, I'm simply a tool in the instruments of God's hands. I'm an instrument, I'm a tool in the instrument of God's hand that he uses to bring about his purpose and his plan in this world we live in. So why is it so important that we walk in purity? Why is it so important that we walk in holiness? There are many reasons, but I want to give you one here this morning, and I can, I'll probably end up giving you more than one throughout this message, but here's one of them. We find in verse 1 where it says this, as we walk in purity and holiness, listen to this. You've heard me say this many times before, because I've, and I say it again today because I haven't been able to get over it. This is overwhelming to me with what I'm getting ready to tell you. I mean, it actually blows my mind. Whenever I see in this verse of Scripture, as we walk, it says, in purity, and as we walk in holiness, it says this, it pleases God. Did you hear that? It says, it pleases God. We can please God. We have the ability to please God. We cannot please people, but we can please God. That to me is, again, with the same word, but that's overwhelming to me to think that I can please God. To, to think about even the numbers that we have here with many of our folks gone today, there is no way that, that I can please all of you. Some of you are not pleased with me right now for some reason or another. I can get this side over here all pleased. I can get you pleased. And I can get you saying, I, I'm on board. I'm pleased. I'm pleased. I'm pleased. And then I can go over here and they're not going to be pleased. And then I can figure something out to get them pleased over here. And while I'm working to get them pleased over here, I, you're not pleased anymore. And, and so then I'm going back and forth. And many pastors, that's what their ministry is about. Trying to keep as many people pleased as possible. Trying to keep as many people as happy as possible. But I'm here to stand to tell you here this morning, you, me, us in this room, believers in this room, we can please God. Does that shake your body? <laughs> I'm not sure where I was going with that, but, but any, 
I mean, that to me gets me moving to the fact of knowing, and I know I'm being repetitive here today, but that, that I can please God, that, that, that my life with what I do and decisions I make and things where I go and, and how I walk this walk that leads to progression as I go to a point that God has placed me to head toward, that he sits back and he's just pleased with the way that I'm living my life. A born-again Christian can please God who is living in purity and holiness. That's one of the reasons, again, we felt like the Hagios Conference was right what God wanted us to do at the time that he sent it to us. Because what God, what we need to be doing more than anything, let me tell you, the sign of a healthy church, the sign of a healthy church that's moving forward is a church that's pleasing God. But we have so many different things to, to think about that we're trying to put together to please God. I won't go to church today because I know it pleases God. If you came to church today just to come to church today say, well, okay, i got to go please God, you didn't succeed. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. God wants every day of our life to be a day. And I know that's a struggle, strain, and difficult time to, to accomplish daily, but that's his desire for us. And if it's so-called God's desire for us, he provide, provides for us to get there. He provides for us to accomplish it in our lives. So who do you want to please? Oh, just, just be as open and honest as you possibly can here today. Who do you want to please? Do you want to please your friends? Do you want to please your family? Do you want to please your neighbors? Do you want to please your pastor? Do you want to please your Sunday school teacher? Do you want to please? Who do you want to please? Who is priority in your life? You see, if you say no to the devil and yes to the Lord, God says, I'm pleased. I'm pleased. What, what more do we want if God is pleased in our lives than to know God is saying, good job. You know who wants to be the best and loudest and most clear cheerleader in your life is the Lord God. He wants to cheer you on. He wants to cheer you on and help you to understand. Verse 3 says this, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. See, this was a perverted region of the, air, the, of the world. There was so much going on. We see that purity and holiness is the revealed will of God. That's what he says right here. It says here, this is the will of God. The will of God is purity and holiness. Living it in your life. What's the will of God? Sanctification. What's the will of God? Sanctification to be set apart. Sanctification is me getting out of the way and letting God, letting Jesus have it all. Letting him take over my life fully and completely. And when that happens, he's making my life pure. He's making my life holy. That's the life of a believer. How, we, how have we escaped that? How have we left that? How is it not a priority in our lives today? Romans 6.6 6 says this, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Verse 12, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, he says, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under the law. But what are you under? Grace. We are under grace. And then verse 3 again with those verses in mind. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. You're getting ready to hear some of the saddest words in the church today. And we see it happening in all churches everywhere you look. Denominations doesn't matter. 
We have the same percentages of Christian marriage couples divorcing or committing adultery as we do lost couples. It's the same percentage. Same percentage of Christian couples, Christian Christian individuals committing adultery, Christian couples committing adultery in the church as we do outside the church, the same percentage. We have the same percentage of marriage couples in the church getting divorced as outside the church, the very same. There's no difference of divorce in the church than outside the church. We have the same the same percentage of Christian singles sleeping around as we do singles in the world that are without Jesus, that sleep with one another, that see nothing wrong with living with one another before marriage. We, we have that in the church. What's wrong? Some will say, well, that's just the changing of times, Pastor. You need to get over that. Times change. You can't stay back in the in the early, early years of life. Things have changed. The Bible days, that, that's way back then. That's changed. We, we have to make change today. I want to tell you what's wrong. The church needs to get back to purity and holiness. The church at one time was walking in purity and holiness more than ever before, and we've moved away from it. We need to decide we're going to live the life or we're not going to live the life. West Acres needs to decide as corporate body, we need to decide, are we going to live the Christian life or are we not going to live the Christian life? We need to decide where we're going to go and who we're going to serve and who we're going to dedicate ourselves to, who we're going to submit to, who we're going to surrender to. You may say again, why should I live that life that you're talking about here today? Why? Why is that so important? Well, one of these days... God is going to turn to his son, and he could be getting ready to turn that way right now. I don't know. But he's going to turn to his son one of these days, and he's going to say, that's it. That's it. It's time. Go ahead and close the book on history. And he comes. One of these days, God is going to turn to his son in heaven, and Jesus is going to step up, stand up, and he's going to shout from heaven, here I come. Here I come, and we will know from the east to the west to the north to the south, everywhere in this world, that he is coming. That he is coming. The scripture tells us he's going to descend from heaven with a shout. He's going to take us home, and when he comes to get me, I want to be living down here pure, holy lives. I want to be living the way he wants me to. That he desires me to. I don't want to be known as a gossip. I, I don't want to be known as a complainer. I don't want to be known as an adulterer. I don't want to be known as a fornicator. I don't want to be known about those things. That's not who I am because I've been set apart. That God has been able to show me in his word what's right. And if you are a complainer and a gossiper and an adulterer and a fornicator, I want to tell you, Jesus doesn't say, okay, go ahead and, and you do your thing. There's no hope for you. He's saying, no, I love you and I want you to surrender your life to me. I will forgive you. I will give you peace and life and, 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 and excitement and joy and something to look forward to. See, heaven, what a place that's going to be. Do you know what it's like to be forgiven by the Savior? You know, we, we're really quick to point our fingers to a lot of things that's going on in this world and people and decisions they're making. You know, what God is wanting us to stop doing is pointing fingers and having our opinions and our thoughts. And he's wanting us just to love those people. To love them, to pray for them, because... They're really no different than we are. This is a great place right here for me to stop and ask you the most important question of the day. Are you a believer? Do you know Christ? Are you 100% sure that you know Jesus in your life? 
Do you know him without a doubt? 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 says this. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. I love that word vessel. The word vessel is talking about your body. He's talking about your body. Your body, guess what? Is the temple of the Lord. Your body is the temple of the Lord. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit that rules and resides within us. And you may say, Pastor, I, I'll do with my body what I want to do with my body. I, I'll, I'll do with my body whatever I want to do with my body. And the only thing that I say to that, you better be careful and get permission from God to make sure what you're doing to your body is okay with Him because it's not your body, it's His. He lives within you. We need permission from Him. If He's okay for you to to be an alcoholic, if he's okay for you to do drugs, if he's okay with you to do the things that destroy and cause this body to have less and less years because we don't take care of it correctly and properly, if he's okay with that, then go for it. But he lives within you. Having the permission from God to treat your body the way you do because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who know God. It says, not in passion of lust. Where, where do you stop adultery? Where do you stop fornication? Where do you stop it? Whenever that start, when that gets in your mind, and that's, usually, that's where it starts. The Bible says it always starts in the mind. Always starts in the mind. We begin thinking about things, and you begin to think more and think more and think more. And when temptation comes, where do you stop it? You don't stop it whenever you're in the motel room getting the key to put in the door, to open the door, to have your lady to go in. That's not when you stop it. That's, that's not whenever you say, okay, we gotta, we got to come up with another plan. You stop it, church, and, and I know this with my own heart in life, and I know you do as well, but you stop it when the desire comes. When the desire comes in your life. When you start thinking about it, you've got to give it to the Lord. That's when you say, God, I need your help. God, I need you. I need you to step in. I need you to take over. You've heard me mention before, but I have to tell the story again. It's short, brief, but it's to the point. I don't have any daughters, as you know, other than a daughter-in-law, but, of course, she's already married to my son. Um, but I'm talking about a daughter-daughter, a daughter-daughter that I walk down the aisle, a daughter-daughter that I give away. But I shared this story with you one time. This father said this. He was always concerned about his daughter and who she dated. He would always interview the, the, the boy. He did not go out, his daughter would never went out on a date without being interviewed, uh, finding out about his family, finding about what he believed, finding out about this. But he always told his daughter this. He said, you, every time you get in the car with a boy, you put the Bible in the center of the two of you. And said, if he ever tries anything, he'll have to climb over Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to get to you. I thought, well, what a beautiful story. Don't try anything because you got Matthew, Mark, and John, and Luke, and all those to have to deal with. See, purity, purity, God at work within our lives. Let me take you to the second point here this morning. We must walk in purity and holiness. Yes, I know I've already talked about purity and I always already talked about holiness. But we must walk in it. The Bible says we must walk in reverence. If my walking in purity with God, that's going to affect the way I treat other people. Purity and holiness are never rude. Purity and holiness looks at people through the eyes of God. See it in verse 6. It says that no one should take advantage of or defraud his brother in this manner. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. 
You know what he's talking about here? He's talking about adultery and fornication, premarital sex. He says you're taking something that doesn't belong to you. He says you had better respect God. Take him seriously. I say that to the, the students and teenagers and, and children and, and, and husbands and wives that before you make decisions that are going to be devastating to you, and it may not seem like it at the time, you need to really seriously look and see what God's word has to say and how he wants to provide help for you to overcome. Finally this morning, let me give you the third point. Finally, we see that we are to walk in obedience. You see the theme? Well, you, if you don't see the same theme this morning, you have been away, asleep the whole time. But we're talking about purity. We're talking about holiness. We're talking about obedience. It all goes together here today. Obedience does not mean doing this. It doesn't mean doing that. I've got to go over here and accomplish this. I've got to go over here and accomplish this. Obedience simply means to surrender your life. Listen, surrender your life to the will of God. That you say, God, here's my life, and I want you to take it over. Do you, do you know what real revival is? And we've been talking a lot about that here today. We can't manufacture it. We can't make it. We can't make it happen. But what is real revival? The simple answer to that question is walking in obedience. And when you're walking in obedience and purity and holiness, you're pleasing to God. And when that happens, the thing that happens, that just happens, is revival takes place in our hearts and our lives and in his church. Look at verse 7. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. God called us to live for him. We're called to holiness. We're called to be sanctified vessels, the scripture says. God's desire is to touch America. But he can't do it. He wants to touch West Acres. But many times he can't do it. He doesn't have vessels that are holy and pure. That he can feel. That he can work in and through. 1 Thessalonians 4, 8 again says this. Therefore he who rejects this does not reject man but God. Who has also, who has also given us. His Holy Spirit. Given us His Holy Spirit. When a person is controlled by the Holy Spirit, when he's controlled fully and completely by the Holy Spirit, then he is holy and pure. He's able to be not who he is, but who God's created him or her to be. The world, as you know, and you, can, you, you look on a billboard, you look in a magazine, you watch TV. The world is looking for glamour. The world is looking for glamour. The world says it matters what you look like on the outside. It, it matters what you look like on the outside. And I want to tell you, God's not impressed with how handsome you are, guys. And ladies, he's not impressed with how pretty you are on the outside. That's not what he looks at. That's not what he looks at. He does not look on the outside. He does not look on the outside of a man or a woman or a child or a teenager. He's not looking on the outside at all. He doesn't look there. He looks on your heart. He looks at your heart. And when he sees purity and holiness, you know what God says? I like that. And God automatically is pleased. He's pleased. A simple message today that can be transforming and life-changing. If we make a decision today, hey, Lord, I've heard from you this morning. I've seen these eight verses of Scripture. I want to be pleasing to you. I want you to give me the strength, the desire, the help, the hope of being able to accomplish this in my life every day of my life. Every day of my life be pleasing to the Lord. Walking with the Lord. When I'm tempted, God, I need your help. How many times, especially guys, how many times with, without answering that line, how many times have you said, oh God, I need your help. 
How many times, men in the church, have you wished that you had called out to, to God for help because you didn't and God didn't help and you ended up messing your life up for a time and your family's life for a time? God, we need your help. We need your help this morning, God. We need you to invade our lives. We need you to take over. There are all kinds of things in this room today that people are facing. I said it a few weeks ago, but I told you every time I stand and look out in the sanctuary, Sunday after Sunday, one of the things that God allows me to remember and to think about is to see all the smiling faces in this room, but to know there are a majority of you in this room that have broken hearts. That, that might be a marriage, marriage issue, child rearing issue, job issue, cancer, heartbreak, heart problems, whatever it may be. Everyone in this room is facing something that's bringing heartbreak to you. And if you're not facing it now, he's preparing you now to get ready for when it comes because it will. On every pew. Let's look down that pew again. And it might even be you, but I can guarantee you at least one or two or three people on that pew are going through some major things in their life right now. And what we need to do is say, God, we need your help. We need your help. We need you to step into my condition, my situation, and take over my life. Would you do that right now? Would you ask him? Pray with me.